This video is the second in the Tavistock series. So if you have not seen the first video, you might want to check that out. Though it's not entirely necessary, it is recommended and the link is in the description of this video. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, the United States was chiefly an agrarian society, but industrialization was going to change all of that. You know, at one time, the lifeblood of the family was the farm and the entire family worked the land. Once industrialization came along, the same families would seek employment and steady wages in the factory and the entire family would work the factory floor. What I want to illustrate here is that for most of human history, child labor was a reality of life. And during the 19th and early 20th centuries, child labor in mines and mills and factories was normal practice in places like the United States and Great Britain. We're talking about very young children here too. It was commonplace for children ages 5 to 15 to work 16 hour shifts or 60 hours or more per week. Now these children didn't have it easy either. Not only did they work very long hours, but they generally worked in very harsh conditions. Now the government of the UK would take action and enact child labor protections. First with an 1819 law that set the minimum working age at nine years old and the maximum hours at 12 per day. They would lower that in 1833 to uh, 10 hours per day. Consider also that around the year 1914, the First World War begins. In those four years, over a quarter of a million young British men under the age of enlistment would join the armed services and fight in the war, the youngest confirmed being 12, but many age 14 and up enlisted without much objection from anyone. Imagine being 15 and fighting trench warfare in Gallipoli. In the U.S., the Draft Act of 1917 would conscript uh, approximately 2 million men ages 18 to 45. Another 2 million would enlist. Back home, children were being indoctrinated in the schools with patriotic propaganda, and even the Boy Scouts would be called on to sell war bonds and distribute pro-war pamphlets. So here's the other point I want to illustrate. If we consider the term teenager from a modern cultural point of view, if we consider the common stereotypes associated with life as a teenager, then we have to look at history and acknowledge that Prior to the 1920s, there was no such thing. And that's not to say the people aged 13 to 19 during the 20s could be considered the first modern teens, but they were the first in that age range that, for the most part, didn't enter the workforce until the age of like 13, you know, like the movie Newsies, or they were lucky enough to attend schooling until 18. One side effect of industrialization was the abundance of goods and the level of production allowed the lower classes to begin to mimic the upper class tradition of the husband as the breadwinner and the wife as the homemaker. And better wages and lower prices on goods created an economy where for the most part, children didn't have to work anymore. So this was also the time of automobiles and jazz music spreading by means of radios becoming more commonplace and would eventually lead to the swing culture of the 1930s. Here's why I mentioned the movie Swing Kids. Of course, this would all be interrupted by the Great Depression and World War II. Now about 100 years after the British the U.S. would enact its child labor laws in 1938 when Franklin Roosevelt would sign the Fair Labor Standards Act into law. And this restricted most forms of child labor, except on a farm, and regulated employment for those under 16 and 18 years of age. In 1945, the Second Great War would come to an end. That same year, the New York Times would publish the Teenage Bill of Rights. This charter had been drawn up by a group of experts from the Jewish Board of Guardians, Child Guidance, and Delinquency Prevention agency of the New York Jewish Philanthropies. Now, according to the Times author, Elliot E. Cohen, the, the charter was framed to meet the problems of growing youth, and the article itself is proof that no matter what rock and roll rumor may suggest, the word teenager was not coined by Billy Haley in the comments in 1957. But the 1950s is when the teenager really came into being culturally. Because before the 1950s, there was no time to listen to bebop records and drive up to make out point with Suzy Q to fight an industrial strength bra clasp. You were likely too busy working in a mine or fighting a war. So the teenager isn't really a natural phenomenon. Adolescence is. But the concept of the teenager is an artificial social construct created by child psychologists, Madison Avenue advertisers, Hollywood, and the music industry. And the entire period of post-war 1950s American history, the population was primed for and subject to an incredible level of propaganda and indoctrination. This was the time in which televisions really showed up in everyone's homes. This was the beginnings of an attempt to create a new culture, a popular culture, which would transcend the religions, the social classes, and the racial lines. This culture would eventually twist tradition on its head 
and it would slowly and gradually acclimate the populace to radical ideas which it would reject outright if presented plainly. But when implemented gradually it would seem to be the natural progress of society when it was anything but. Now in the next episode of this Travis Stock series we'll be looking at the Pied Piper and how the counterculture movement of the 1960s was an entirely fabricated social engineering that forever altered the course of human history in a way that before couldn't have been imagined. Before I wrap this up, I've been talking with an artist recently named C.B. Schwartz who was kind enough to share some of his conspiracy, cryptid, and UFO themed art with me and I want to share that with you so in the description you'll find two links that will take you to his artwork. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and will consider subscribing. I strive to produce non-biased content without needless intros or relying on recycled footage and dramatic music. And while some hide behind cartoon characters or play, watch me surf the web and read you an article someone else wrote that you are perfectly capable of reading to yourself, I show my face and I use my real name and I speak to you like adults because I know my viewers care more about substance than polish. And I firmly believe these type of fringe topics can stand on their own when treated with impartiality and due deference, and I hope you feel the same. Now, if you want to see this channel grow, please keep liking and sharing these videos, and I want to thank you to everyone that has been doing that because it makes a world of difference. Like, I can totally see the growth. And I want to give a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. There's a link in the description if you're financially able to contribute. It's just a buck a month, and it gets us way close to our goal. I want to thank you so much for watching. This has been The Creepy Little Book. I am Pete, and until next time, stay creeped out.